Hey everybody, uh, Glenn and Ben here from Good Movie Monday. Thank you for hitting play. Uh, we have a special series of Monster Fest themed videos for you and um, we're taking time to, I guess, get to know some of the creators behind films that are on the official Monster Fest lineup. Ben, I'm going to hand it straight over to you, mate. Who's on the slab today? Uh, well, today we're joined by John Campopiano, the director of the phenomenal Snapper, a man-eating turtle movie that never got made. Uh, which plays in a double feature with uh, Piers, now I'm going to pronounce this name incorrectly, Piers Berlzheimer, <laughs> Berlzheimer's, I'm so sorry, Piers, uh, <laughs> Crabs, which is a, a, a which is also like a kind of a creature feature uh, on Saturday, December 4th at 7pm at Cinema Nova. Um, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Now, as the title suggests, your film is a kind of a warts and all look at a failed production of what uh, Vinegar Syndrome lovingly call a regional horror film, which... Yeah, yeah, I guess the title does does sort of give it away a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. And this is shot in, like, it's central Massachusetts, right? That's where this uh, uh, film was... Destined, yeah, the, right? the original Snapper project was from Worcester, Massachusetts, which is central Mass. Yep, about oh, I'd say like an hour west of Boston. Right, and th I mean, this is like I've heard of like there's a lot of documentaries about films that were made. This is the yeah. first uh, documentary I've seen on a film that wasn't made. Uh, yeah. How did you even? And it's a facet. It is a fascinating story. But how did you even hear about this film? Yeah, so the, the, the two guys behind it, Mark Vo and Mike Savino, they're kind of like cult figures in a way, cult filmmakers. They did a film back when they were students in college, film students, called Attack of the Killer Refrigerator, which for the VHS collectors out there will know that that's a bit of a coveted tape. It fetches like north of 500 bucks when copies pop up. Bootlegs abound. You see bootlegs at conventions all the time. But So these guys are based in Worcester. And I'm based in New England, too. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, so I've gotten to know these guys over the years. I've known them probably about a decade. And we were at a horror convention and um, we were just kind of talking about projects and stuff. And Mark said to me kind of off the cuff, he said, hey, you know, we tried to make a movie about a killer snapping turtle. And I thought, oh, that that sounds pretty cool. I mean, there aren't many turtle, you know, killer turtle films out there. I mean, I guess the Boogans is kind of turtle like, but you know, there's no killer turtle movies. And so I went home, didn't really think much of it, you know, again, until I got a text from him a couple of days later and he had found the photos, the production photos that they had taken while they tried to make this movie. And I realized like, wow, man, like they, they tried to build, like they built animatronic turtles. They, they really went for it. They shot it on, on 16 millimeter film. So I thought, man, wouldn't that be interesting to sort of tell the story of these guys and this project that never panned out? Admittedly, I went into it not really knowing what the story would be. And I think they were a little bit dubious about it. They, they were like, yeah, you know, they knew me. So they're like, sure, we'll sit for an interview and talk about this. But like, what's the story? Like, what, what is this documentary going to be? And I kind of just went for it, you know, knowing that we had all this amazing visual material. They had like a, a great archive of this attempted film. So I figured, I hoped that maybe we could put something together with their interviews and all the amazing archive that they have. Yeah, because it is, it is. I'm astonished. At, like uh, you don't see a lot of material like that for you know big budget films that were made. Like that stuff all disappears, and they've got, they had some amazing stuff. Like and some amazing behind the scenes video. Yeah. Like the actual, and you kind of do go into detail on how they did some of the effects, the early effects, and they you know they do talk about how that didn't exist. There was no special effects world in, in kind of Massachusetts, in Boston at the time, like that, you know. Yeah, not a known one anyway. I mean, I think yeah. the, the, you know, the, the perception is that like there were films happening in New York and there were films happening in L.A. Um, but obviously there's regional filmmakers all over the place. I mean, you know, the one that comes to mind, and it's because I just picked up the Arrow box set, is, you know, Bill Rabane in in Wisconsin, you know, like all the crazy movies that he made and yeah. he was based in and around Michigan. Um, there's like a lot of these kinds of filmmakers. Um, and so there was a scene out here, you know, um, we have kind of like a weird attraction called spooky world, which has sort of been dubbed the first horror theme park, which was huge. I mean, when I was a kid here, it was huge. And these guys are connected to that scene. 
So there's kind of a sidebar story in Snapper that talks a little bit about that. And um, so there was definitely a scene here of guys just trying to make it, you know, like DIY filmmakers just building shit in their garage and just shooting stuff. And I figured at the heart of it, we could all sort of relate to this idea of grabbing a camera and trying to make a film with our friends. You know, like I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that. Um, so I just I thought maybe there was something relatable here in the story, you know, um, and like I said, I'm interested in regional filmmaking because I feel like those stories haven't really been told. And a lot of those guys, you know, for whatever reason, really documented the process. A lot of them, you know, um, in some of the other docs that I've done about films that are kind of more cult films or better known films, the guys that tend to be the ones that really save photos or took photos or like the special effects makeup artists and these, these kinds of things, because they're documenting, it's like their resume, they're documenting the work they did. Yeah. So they, they're the ones that tend to have this amazing trove of, you know, materials. And that was the case with these guys. And I felt like Scott Andrews was, was super interesting talking about his kind of career and stuff and moving on. Like I, I do like, I actually really did like next stop wonderland, which he, he did say he went on to work on kind of after this and yep. it made him quit <laughs> the film business because he didn't like how they were, they were treated in the pressure and all that sort of stuff. But I do actually quite like that film. But and then he goes on to he's sculpting toys for Hasbro and stuff. Yeah, it's Star Wars of- toys. I mean, he's 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 super talented. And I just think that you know, not everybody wants to you know live that lifestyle of making films. And um, you know, he wanted to start a family, and it just like, like wasn't in the cards for him. I don't think you know he wanted to stay in Worcester too. He wasn't willing to relocate. You know, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's super, super talented. We did um, in the doc, we talked a little bit about, they made these promotional turtles, these little snapper turtles they would send out with like their press kit basically. Mm-hmm. And so we remade those. Scott has a 3D printing business wow. now. So we remade a bunch of them and sold them and stuff like that, you know, um, which was super rad. He put like, he put the title of the doc on the belly of these little turtles Um so awesome. he's super talented, still working with his hands and sculpting and stuff. Yeah, right. Awesome. Well, yeah, yeah. before before um, we came on on mic on camera, we asked you to come up with five films that either inspired you to become a filmmaker, inspired this project in particular, or just a movie that you really loved. So um, why don't we kick things off with y- your first one? Sure. So I, I wrote, I, I kind of, I made a little list. And I kept them kind of in the genre world, like the horror genre world and stuff. And so we'll, we'll go chronologically just to keep it, you know, keep it easier for me. So the first one is definitely Nosferatu, Murnau's Nosferatu from 1922. Um, that like I, as I was really getting into horror films in like middle school, um, I came across like this weird DVD copy. And I've actually tried to find it since and, and haven't been able to find it, but typo negative they dubbed like the typo negative music like their band music underneath as like the score right and I'm, it was like so far out man and so like my mom and i would watch it in like 10 minute increments before she would take me to school and um i just remember like the experience of watching that film it was the first silent film i had ever seen the music was so weirdly perfect you know like i never really became a typo negative fan but like that the lead vocal like hit like their sound just really worked in some way with that film and it really turned me on to like german expressionism like in years later i would kind of really dig into those films you know the hands of orlack like all that stuff yeah. um and so i think like that film and then also my wife is from germany and so we went and visited her family about 4 or 5 years ago and they're in like Bavaria, Southern Germany. So we were going to stay with them for a week and then travel all around Germany. So we, we went all the way up to Lübeck, which is Northern Germany, right on the Baltic sea, which is where they filmed Nosferatu. And kind of one of the themes you're going to pick up on in the five films that I picked is that going to these filming locations is, is really important to me. Like I, I love going to filming locations of movies that I really dig. And so we spent like a day, we stayed two nights in Lubeck and went and found all the locations from Nosferatu. And it felt like I was like stepping into this black and white movie that I had grown up watching. Um, and so, yeah, it didn't really influence me in terms of being a creative person, but it like really made a huge impact on me just like in terms of loving horror films. It's a perfect you- example. It's, I was going to say, it's a perfect example of, um, you know, the importance of shadows and light and, and, and how to you know use that as an effect like that image that famous image of him on the stairs is just like iconic 
Oh my God. Yeah. And him in the windowsill, like disappearing, yeah. like just all of it, him on the rowboat with the coffin in the back. I mean, it, it's, it's really, um, yeah, it's a stunning film, you know? And did that make you appreciate shadow of a vampire even more? I think so. <laughs> Cause I think yeah. like, that's such a great yeah. meta horror film. Yeah. You know, oh, totally. Like, yeah. It, it really works. Especially if you actually, if you are familiar with Nosferatu, yeah it's like it's so it's you know it's so good yeah i did those in a double feature at um the treasury theater back in the day ben and um nosferatu had like a live score with like an uh some kind of electro guy with a a panel just doing all this weird doing a lot of sounds yeah Yeah. it's great was it like a theremin like one of those like yeah 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 Yeah. there was a theremin it's a yeah a bit like what the 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 screaming meanies do down here ben it's like that kind of that kind of thing it was great yeah right that's how i saw a white zombie the first time they had wow. had a whole new score. They had the, I think they actually, the whole uh, soundtrack of that film had been lost on the film print they found. Mm. And so they, they got local actors to dub all of the dialogue and they wow. did the score live in the, in the theater at the Astor. Amazing. Halloween. Yeah. We're, you know, in this part of where we are in New England, we have a lot of like kind of a lot of indie art house cinemas that are really thriving and that like do very well. And, and one of them is called the Coolidge Corner Theater and it's in, in Boston and Berkeley school of music, which is like the, the music school to go to, um, they have a silent film orchestra. And so like they host all kinds of events like that. <laughs> Amazing. Come and, Amazing. You know, and like, these are students, but it's like, man, like this could be symphony hall. I mean, like they're, they're just amazing. And to hear it live and see it, you know, is, oh. those are cool. Those, you I'd, know, I would love to have something like that. Down Even there. if you're lukewarm on the film that you're seeing, like go see a film. If you have a live orchestra, like it's a cool experience for sure. Yeah. 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 All right, so what's uh, what's uh, number two? Number what's two is movie? Let's Scare Jessica to Death from 1971. You're right. That movie gets a lot of love here. It's a, it's a, it is a, a, um, it's still a cult film, definitely a kind of, but it's one yeah. of those, like, if you know, you know. Right. Yeah, it was like, you know, I remember seeing it, and, and actually, I think I was nonplussed when I first saw it. I think, like, oh, that was really interesting, you know. But over the years, I've revisited it a lot of times um, and was lucky enough to do filming some filming location stuff for the Shout Factory Blu-ray that they put out of it recently. Um, It's just, you know, like I had never from a tonal perspective, I had never seen anything like that film, you know, like like my palms were sweaty and just sort of watching the paranoia and sort of like the the mental sort of um, collapse of this woman on film, you know, there was no blood, there's no nudity. It wasn't like a lot of the other films I was watching at the time, you know, which was like, yeah, what we were all watching in middle school, you know, like the <laughs> Friday the 13th and all that stuff, right. Hellraiser. And, and um, it was so yeah. different. Um, it was a disappointing in its lack of exploitation. <laughs> for but, sure. But- <laughs> That's an understatement yeah. for sure. <laughs> But there was something about it tonally where, it, you yeah. know, it was just um, the atmosphere of that film was just and it was filmed not far from where I live. It was filmed in Connecticut. Um, so, again, coming back to this theme, right, like over the years, I've gone and visited the locations from that film. And it's been like a very cool experience to sort of step into that movie. Um, but it's yeah, it's a beautiful film. And and. Um, I love there's a Jaws connection. Uh, you may know, Glenn, the sequel guy, John Hancock, who mm-hmm. was originally directing Jaws 2 before Jeanneau Schwartz came on board, directed Let's Scare Jessica to Death. And when you find out why he was pulled off of Jaws 2, you're like, oh, OK, you know, he wanted it to be a very dark film. Amity Island was boarded up. Right. Tourism was killed because of the shark. And Universal Studios was like, nah, we need like a colorful movie. This isn't the sequel we want, you know. Um, yeah, we need we need Jaws one again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we need Jaws one with colorful sailboats and sexy teenagers. Like, we don't need this depressing, you know. No, they're, um, they're, they're pushing. We need we need Michael Caine to dance. Oh, that's like, we need to, and they like, and they kept the directors kept pulling it back. No, no, we're not going right. to. And then eventually, eventually, the studio got their way. Exactly. Well, I, I'm not sure the studio even know that they made Jaws 4, so they would just have to do whatever they want. Um, but uh, but yeah, so let's scare Jessica to death. I mean, it's a quiet film, you know, it's not, but but man, it's just visually, it's just beautiful, I think. Um, and a kind of a cool snapshot of a woman losing losing her mind, you know, or and and it's, you know, I think it was also one of the first horror films where there was really no conclusion. You know, yeah. like they, they didn't tie anything up at the end. Yeah, there's they were no just sort of left. Yeah, yeah. 
from a narrative also, it perspective, also, it was all over the place. You know, it really didn't, it wasn't a cohesive narrative. It was just kind of more of a visual journey. And, and then was she hearing things? Was she seeing ghosts? Were the, were the town, was the town in on it? Or was it just her paranoia? We don't really know, you know, and I, I don't know. I love that. I like to think of it as the horror version of Funny Farm, Chevy Chase's Funny Farm, and the town oh, are definitely the town are <laughs> definitely in on it. <laughs> okay, they just uh, they just got to move those those lambs testicles. <laughs> man, I've never thought of it that way. That's awesome. Because <laughs> oh, uh, and also enough. wasn't it wasn't it a lost like it wasn't it's not a lost film but it was one of those ones that was in it was tied up in kind of right hell for a long time because no one could figure out who owned it so it was a long oh, time. Like I, think right. I don't know people were trying to get it out on blu-ray a lot earlier than it was but they just couldn't there were like two or three people who claimed ownership but none of them had chain of title and can prove it and it was uh, a bit it was a very kind of complicated uh mess i think yeah. I, I could maybe could I'm be right. Of another film yeah, there. I think you know another film that's kind of caught up in that same peril is Alligator, and I really, I really want like a definitive. And it's too bad Robert Forster's gone now. I mean, fuck, that would have been amazing. But yeah. um, Alligator, I think, is tied up in a similar thing where there's a reason we haven't seen, you know, a nice release of of that film. I think it's ownership issues, rights issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Uh, why don't we move on to number three? Number, number three is Jaws. Um, that Jaws is my favorite film. You know, I mean, it's a lot of people's favorite films. Um, again, you know, Amity Island, Martha's Vineyard is about an hour and a half away from me. So I would go there with my family when I was a kid. And, and like a lot of coastal New England towns, nothing has changed in the last 40 or 50 years. So again, you're stepping off the ferry and you're in Amity Island, you know? Yeah. Um, and the, the Martha's Vineyard has hosted like they call them Jaws Fest. And the first one was back in 2005. And Peter Benchley was still alive. He was there. And I went as a college student and I've collected Jaws memorabilia like my whole life. So I've got like a big collection of Jaws stuff. And so I my my awkward, socially awkward attempt of making friends that weekend going and not knowing anybody was I had a T-shirt made up with my collection on it and yeah. figured, hey, someone will notice this and want to talk to me, you know. <laughs> Or they'll throw things at me. I'll get bullied. I mean, it could go either way. But so I did that and ended up meeting a bunch of people that have since become lifelong friends, people that like I'm still very close with and and that the relationship is nothing to do with Jaws anymore. Um, Uh, Ben, take take note, Ben, make a T-shirt, get friends. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, maybe that was the one and only time that worked. (laughs) That was the one and only time. I found that it doesn't work if you put like if you put like a naked woman T-shirt on. You don't, okay. It does not attract naked women to you. Yeah, no, it's it funny how, yeah. yeah, that's right. I forgot what collectibles you have. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> you get canceled now. I'm so, yeah, you just get canceled. Lad. It's a yeah. Um, it's a giant fist on your t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's from the movie Fist. No, it's <laughs> right. Yeah, I would love to wear like a t-shirt with my street trash collection, but it's not going to attract the same kind of attention that I want. You know. Um, <laughs> yeah so again that one man like you know the, the locations having it so close by you know collecting stuff from that movie um developing like kind of a social network of, of really a family around that film in the last 20 years makes that one kind of worth being on the list definitely I do, it's yeah Go on. i was gonna say i do i do love how jaws is like it is a horror film and yet it's also the kind of film that kids want to have like lunch boxes of Mm, right like it just you know it seems to cross that uh that generational divide yeah well i mean it was the first summer blockbuster which i think as a concept we take for granted but i you know and i wasn't around in 75 but the way that that film kind of swept the world like must have been amazing to just sort of sit back and and be a part of that you know and um, the way it was merchandised and stuff right around the time star wars right i mean that that's like um well, I mean, but it resonated a- really heavily down here because we have this whole shark culture, you know, with our beaches. Yeah. So it, it really petrified. There's a movement. It petrified an entire generation from going to the beach. And then the yeah. ripoffs. I mean, come on. Like, that's that's something, like, I've, I've also been collecting for many, many years. Like, all the, the Jaws-inspired films. Yeah. Um, one Tell of which, you- my favorite, Dark Age. I mean, Dark Age is, like, a, a, what a favorite. Yeah, what a classic. Of, absolute favorite. I was going to um, go um, with Razorback, but that's... Razorback's up there, too. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I got the Umbrella Blu-ray. I mean, anytime those films get a release, I mean, I've got the Laserdisc. I kind of like all all media, but um, both of those films for sure. Yeah. Um, Best thing about so. Dark Age is the fact that they they kill an infant right in the first like ten minutes. <laughs> Which is a beautiful segue to my fourth film, actually. Oh, like, that, 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 dude, you're, the you're setup welcome. there was, that's a stunning setup. <laughs> so Pet, Pet Cemetery was another one for me. Um, and that was obviously like the first documentary film project I ever worked on or, or did was the making of that, the documentary we did, Unearthed and Untold. Um, seeing that as a kid, you know, I'm an only child, but I had friends in the neighborhood who had older brothers. So they would be renting all these movies. And that was the way that I saw. That was like my source of, all of these films was kind of, you know, going over to friends' houses and older brothers would rent these tapes and put yeah. them on and scare the shit out of us. The older um, brother network. It's like the cool uncle network. Like that's where you, that's where you got music from. That's where you got absolutely. horror films from. It <laughs> yeah. was, uh, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And Pet Cemetery was one of those things. And I mean, just seeing an infant get hit by a Mack truck, um, <laughs> like your little brain can't even process it at that age, you know? And then Zelda, like, the, the, the sister with, I mean, it was just that film to me, like left a huge impression. Yeah, it's, um, it's grotesque. It's the darkest, I think, of Stephen King's work in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, what did you make of the, the redo, the reboot, if you will? Um, you-, you know, I, I liked parts of it. I thought it, it looked visually, it looked amazing. Um, but I don't know, it missed something. It, it felt Fred just Gwyn. kind of like another. <laughs> miss Fred Gwynn. <laughs> Well, Fred Gwynn, for sure. Um, yeah, you know, it was fine. I think kind of like the It remake, I think in 20 years from now, people are still going to be talking about Tim Curry yeah. Yeah. in the miniseries. For all, for all the flaws, I don't want to say that it's held up. I know Lee Gambin might hear this, and I love Lee. And if I, if I say that it, it holds up or, you know. Um, but, you know, it, it, I just don't think people are going to be talking about Bill Skarsgård and the, and the new one as well as it did. Mm, yeah, you know, or at least not um, part two. I thought part one, part one definitely had its had its bits, had its moments. Yeah. But part two, I think they dropped the ball a bit. I on, think part like part two made the same mistakes that the the finale of the original made. Like it just they didn't fix what needed to be fixed. They they went down that same tacky kind of mm-hmm. um, poorly conceived sort of creature effect. And there well, was and no- I think also too, like at, at the end of the day, we just care more about the kids. Yeah, like yeah. The, the kids in peril are just more interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's you know? right. Um, we just and don't give a shit about these sexy adults that they cast in the new film. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, like yeah. eat him. I don't care. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. It, they seem to have had a good life. Like, there's no, there's no Richard Massa. Like, well, you know, you can't <laughs> have that if you don't have that guy killing himself in the bathtub. Like, I remember like kind of walking in on that scene on TV where he kills himself in the bathtub, having no concept, no kind of knowledge of what had happened before. Like I hadn't seen part one and I just walked in on that scene and was like, what the fuck is this? Like, and it was like this yeah. kind of watershed moment of watching part two before watching part one. Right. But yeah, yeah. that, you know, that has informed like a lifelong love of everything that Richard Massa does. <laughs> and I like, I do not feel that way about any of the, you know, the people in the, in the, in the reboot. Yeah. Yeah, so so back to your you know your question, uh, Glenn. I, I like the the remake was fun to see in the theater. You know, I got to go to like an early press screening of it and take my wife, which was cool. But you know, the original is just so special. You know, and I think the Mary only, Lambert, is a really cool yeah. director. Um, the only thing I like about the remake, to me, to be honest, is the way they did subvert which kid copped it with the truck because mm. it sort of it, it took our expectations and flipped it so that you know it shocked the 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 long serving fans. You know. Right, but um, yeah. what about before we move on to the next one? Uh, Pet Cemetery Two thoughts on that? I think it's really fun. I think it's a fun movie. We I, we kind of regret not um not including it in the documentary, especially because we had Mary Lambert in the chair. You know, at that point we were so focused on finishing it, and and we had so much material for the first one that um it's so different. I mean, it's a shame they couldn't go back to Maine. Even as a kid, I remember watching it, and they go by like the, the kids are bike like. But, you know, riding their bikes past the house, the Creed house. And it's like, oh, man, that's not. You yeah. know, they're not back in yeah, the town that they shot. It in. Yeah. You know, they shot it down in Atlanta, Georgia, which could couldn't be, you know, further from New England. Um, <laughs> it's the south, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's a fun one. It's totally different. I mean, I think she just kind of mm. went for it, you know. Yeah, totally. Very, yeah, experimental in many ways. Yeah. 
All righty, what do we got next? Uh, I think we're, we're down to our last one. Yeah, last one. So the last one is the miniseries. Is it? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, that I think that's the, the first horror movie I really remember seeing. And again, it was a situation where older brother of a friend rented it, put it on, and I barely got past the Georgie scene. I mean, I didn't get past the yeah. 15 minutes and, and made up some bullshit excuse like my mom was calling me. He lived across the street from us. So I was like, oh, I got to go home. And I was terrified. I mean, I was little. I was like seven or eight years old, you know. And Tim Curry so brilliant in that film um, that once the fangs came out, I was like, man, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> but that, and, but I mean, it yeah. is a, it was a genius it's a genius concept like that that you know that the clown hiding in the drain like it is there yeah. are drains everywhere it's not like like for me like poltergeist that scene where the tree comes in that terrified like absolutely yeah shit the bed terrified me because i had a tree outside my bed exactly like that Perfect. if i hadn't had that tree it wouldn't have had that effect every yeah. house on the street has that drain pipe has that kind of that sure. drain like it is everywhere you cannot escape that yeah you know, and anytime you hear like a voice in the street you like yeah, yeah. you know and we've all splashed in puddles and put little boats in the in the gutters and all that kind of stuff yeah what totally the, the thing that yeah. strikes me about it it kind of informs the way i perceive Maine to be like particularly in the stephen king world like it is the one that i think of whenever i think of maine like the way that they shot it yeah i don't know I've, I've not been to maine so i don't know what it's like but that's what in my mind what exactly what it's like yeah i mean i think they did a pretty good job of kind of capturing that i mean so um when we were doing the it documentary which is coming out soon hopefully um we went they filmed it all in vancouver so they filmed that in like british columbia which is in like the pacific northwest of canada so i used to live be there. farther from maine you yeah. used to live there yeah vancouver yeah oh no kidding man so yeah so that's where they filmed it um, so they were able to capture kind of that vibe of me. Um, yeah. yeah. Cause I, I get the feeling like, I don't know the location history for the film, but it looks more like it's Vancouver Island, like sort of that Victorian stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's just, that's where my mind goes when I think of Maine as it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Derry was a character in that movie in a lot of ways, you know, um, Pet Cemetery they did film in Maine. And like, like the miniseries and like Pet Cemetery and the other films I mentioned, I mean, go into these locations for when we were doing the Pet Cemetery documentary, that was a big part of it. Um, and then when we did the It documentary, we went to Vancouver. Um, it was important to kind of like go, like kind of feel those places and step into them, you know? And there are other films like that for me, like when I'm in New York City, it's fun to go see where a taxi driver was shot or Rosemary's Baby, you know, like go to those places that haven't changed much. Um, with Pet Cemetery, it was interesting because King said at the time, he said, you know, I'll write the screenplay and, and you can make Pet Cemetery a film, but you need to film it in Maine. Mm. At that point, Salem's Lot had been filmed, you know, Cujo. A lot of films were set in Maine, but they weren't they weren't shot in Maine. Mm. And he really wanted to bring money to the state. And so that was a stipulation with Pet Cemetery. Like, you got to come to Maine and, and put the money in, you know, into the state, which is pretty cool. You know, but. Have you, uh, speaking of Lee Gambin, have you read his... He, he actually had a, a one-act play on Stephen King writing all of these all these oh. books and stuff. And he's like, oh, all I'm the people, like all of the um, characters from the books kind of like a ghost that kind of haunt his house. And that's really? where the ideas. That was, it, was, it was really good. He, it, it went on. I think he had it on for like a month. At, Amazing. Uh, at, I'm going to uh, have to ask him about that. He and I are working on a documentary film together right now. We're trying to get it off the ground. Uh yeah. History of ecological horror films. Yeah, right. Obviously, Lee's big into eco horror. I'm big into eco horror. Lee literally wrote the, wrote the book on it. Yeah, massacred by Mother Nature. Um, and I love Lee to death. You know, he, he's he's wild and awesome. And um, so he's yeah. actually got. Um, he's doing a um. He's doing a talk at Monster Fest on um, uh, dog dog horror. Yeah, dog exploitation. Dog exploitation. Yeah. Yeah, he's the guy for it, man. I mean, he's the reason Snapper's playing in the festival. I mean, he, you know, I, Lee's great. He's the ultimate connector of things and of people. And um, mm. so, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, we, we've pretty much run the clock out, but John, um, personally, I can't wait to see The Snapper. Um, really looking forward to it. It's definitely the type oh, of movie awesome. I love. Um, and it's screening, as Ben said earlier, alongside Crabs on December 4th at Monster Fest. Everyone should um, head over to the Monster Fest website and have a look into it and grab some tickets. But once again, a huge pleasure chatting with you, mate. Thank you for your time and Thanks, good luck guys. with the film. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, mate.